thank you for your attention and time. And many thanks for Tony for giving me this opportunity to moderate such a small panel just after the uh, very nice uh, sunny uh, lunch. Uh, but I'm sure with the uh, panelists that we have today, leaders in the uh, telecom operators, service providers, uh, will, uh, will grab your attention. We have a lot of very interesting topic uh, to cover today. And uh, I hope you'll stay focused with us. Uh, we have talked this morning about the uh, shift in consumer and enterprise behaviors. Uh, we have also talked about digital transformation. And what we have behind the scene is, of course, the network. Uh, so this, uh, this panel is, of, of course, about the change in the evolution in the network uh, infrastructure. So um, I'll start with the, uh, with the first question, and I'll hand over to, uh, to you all for this, uh, for this first one, if, uh, if I may. So after this, uh, let's say, uh, post-COVID, uh, post uh, your opinion, and especially in the, the post-COVID, which technology trends would continue to explode in terms of network demand and development? Okay, so, please, so I will start. Yes, please. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Hamid Marzoghi. I'm the international CTIO for the Salat Group. Uh, I'm very happy to be here today. Also, I'm very happy to see that we have a full house. Finally, we are back to our uh, normal life. So thank you for the gentlemen for arranging this event. So I'm happy, happy that Dubai is leading this initiative to go back to normal life. And I'm also happy that the telecom sector is participating in this as well. So uh, back to your question, which is very kind of complicated question. I, I think uh, some of you heard that at the Salat Group recently acquired uh, a grocery service provider in the UAE. And uh, someone might ask, what's going on? At Salat is a very big company. It's worth more than $80 billion nowadays. Uh, acquiring such a small uh, business in the UAE is not something usual, let's say. Uh, let me give you an example about what is going on and what we are trying to, uh, to achieve. T today, if you have, let's say, I'll give you an example. If you have a kid that's two years old, you will wake up in the morning and you'll find that he got, he's sick with high temperature. If you are a good parent, you will run immediately to, with him to a doctor. If you are busy at work, you will wait for a couple of hours, hopefully that he will recover by himself. You will go to the doctor and you will wait for a couple of hours to tell you, uh, wait for your turn. The doctor will ask for some samples. Later on, uh, you will wait for the samples results, and then you will get the results. You will go to the pharmacy. The pharmacist there will ask you about a couple of questions about the history of this kid. Uh, is he allergic to any medicine? Uh, is he taking any medicines today? Couple of questions, and there is a, a chance that also at the end, he will give you something that might harm your kid at the end. You will take the medicine and you'll go back home. Hopefully, he will be recovered. What we are trying to achieve is to automate everything, and I will give you an example and about existing technologies that is now available in the market, but till now, nobody's using it. In, in the same scenario, what will happen is that um, your kid will be uh, wearing, let's say, a Fitbit watch, uh, watch uh, from Google that will measure its temperature and the heart rate. At the same time, uh, your, your kid also, or also everyone in this room will be wearing kind of lenses that will take a measurement from your body and measure the couple of things from about the performance of your body. Uh, your kid will be wearing uh, a smart diaper, let's say, which is existing today, and it will take samples from your kid and send it automatically. So all those samples, will be collected and will be sent to a doctor called Watson, today available by IBM. And this doctor will receive the, the measurement. Also, your kid, the moment will burn, uh, burn uh, will be, uh, there will be, uh, he will be performing a DNA test by a company, another company called 23, uh, you and me. It's available in the USA for $99. You can have a complete analysis about your DNA, about your future, what kind of disease that you can develop. And then uh, Watson will analyze all this information, the DNA, and he will send a request to the pharmacy to release a medicine for your kid without even asking any question because in the system, the complete history of your kid, including its DNA, is there. 
At 6 a.m. while you are sleeping, you will receive a message from your personal assistant uh, from Facebook, which is available now, telling you that your kid is sick and we've done all the analysis and the medicine is delivered to your door by a drone or whatever transportation medium. So all this was automated while you are sleeping, and this is what we are trying to do in the technology after, after the, the, the pandemic, because what we have noticed that there's a huge demand for, for digital services. Because of the pandemic situation, or, or the, the situation that was created by the pandemic, we think that uh, we have the, the, the legacy and the control and the connection to everyone in this country, for example, the, the doctors, the pharmacists, the, the patient, the, the parent, everything. We have the connect, connectivity as a telecom provider to connect everyone and provide this digital, digital transformation. So this is what we are trying to do, is a complete digital transformation in this country that we can also share later on with, with the world after that. Thank you. Dr. Mohammed, from Huawei perspective, the, the trends? Oh boy, it's a lot. <laughs> so uh, uh, I, I think if we are before the pandemic, maybe 70% sure that ICT is the platform for developing societies, enriching industries, fixing economy, I think now we are 120% sure. So I think that's what we learned from the pandemic time. Not anything that people are talking about, explosion of, for example, data or whatever, these, these are all normal. Uh, symptoms. So I think we're all sure now that we have to accelerate the pace for digital transformation. And the, guess what? Network infrastructure is right at the middle. It is not behind the scene, as you mentioned. I'm, I'm sorry to disagree. But, uh, but network is fundamentally important. And the way we look at the network, I think it needs to be changed from just uh, more data or faster speed or uh, better performance to more like an enabler and from different perspective. And, and in, quickly, I wanted to mention um, the, 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 why is that happening? Technology, you, you said it right, is number one trend. Uh, technology in terms of, of course, 5G, PON, uh, distributed cloud computing, uh, AI is becoming mature, that's from technology. But it's beyond the technology. Number two, I think, the type of services and the segments that you serve. Just like what's mentioned uh, by you, it's, it's really, the, the, the segments are getting uh, uh, diversified and the services are becoming ubiquitous, no matter to C, to H, to B, uh, and so on and so forth. But it's more important than even the technology and the business. It's the operational excellence. I think we all know now here agree that network is terribly complex. So I think operational excellence is fundamental. Those three, you need to cover them by an envelope of sustainability. Because I'm sorry, if you work day and night to get a more powerful network, faster, bigger, higher, and we're consuming a lot of uh, what's and, 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 um, and hurting our environment and planet Earth emitting you know, carbon footprint is like this, then we are not really doing a good job. So I think for me, these are the most important trends that everyone, and in Huawei, we put it in our perspective. I will say we have two beliefs. ICT is terribly important but it has to come hand in hand with lower the energy consumption, things like that. So with those trends being mentioned, uh, I wanted to mention three uh, points that need to be there for the network without even getting into uh, uh, explaining those. Number one, it is not just about 5G or fiber, it's about fully ubiquitous on-demand access. That's number one, 4G, 5G, PON, OTN, IP. Um, number two, it's about deterministic experience for the service that you need for the end user that you want. Um, number three, which is very important and new, which is the synergy between cloud and network. Right now we see it more and more networks, they are decoupled. We need to have integration and synergy between the network and cloud. And those are the three points add to them, operational excellence, and the more importantly, green, green, greenness. That's, uh, and we can talk more about some of those aspects uh, when you ask more uh, questions about that. Sure. Hamad, please. Thank you very much for, for, for your question. I mean, whenever questions like post-COVID comes, um, comes up like this, the first thing that comes to my mind 
is an article I read somewhere where somebody was asking who actually fast-tracked uh, work-from-home policy. Was it the IT director or the managing director? But I think the right answer was COVID. So what COVID has done is that it has forced everybody to start using technology uh, much more faster. And I think all of us as operators, as, 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 uh, as technology providers, are actually working um, beyond our times of plans to meet up the demands that we've seen um, happening within our markets. I mean, we operate predominantly in Africa, where basically you don't see a lot of technology adoption. But with COVID, schools have gone back to school, to, to, to using um, online even in African cities. But we know that we need to have those coverages into also rural areas. We've seen demands on the infrastructure actually quadrupling from mega 10 gigabytes, that is the highest you could see pre-COVID. Now we're talking about 100 of gigabytes. And as such, there's a need for, I mean, as we've spoken, I've been listening to different speakers since the morning. We're talking about 5G, the cloud, the GPON. But all of that depends on a robust backhaul infrastructure network to support it. And I think technology has come to stay. Post-COVID, all of the things that my, my co-panelists have spoken about in terms of the adoption of technology will continue to be there. But most importantly, what is critical is also the infrastructure that powers all of this, this technology. Thank you. Thank you, Mohammed. Roque, from uh, you. your point so, of view. It's difficult to complement because I of think that the, the, the points have been well, well covered. I, I will perhaps give a, give a, a, I think that we as part of this industry, we have to be proud. Yeah? So COVID has done more for digitalization than all of our marketing speech in the last 10 years, right? This, this is a fact. But I think that the value that the network has, has been put in evidence as never before. Okay? I don't remember any single case in any country in which there was a collapse of the network. And this is really remarkable because it's not only a volume of traffic that we have seen graphical with a lot of peaks, it's the pattern of that traffic. All of us, we have been working with multiple hours of interesting meetings on video from our home at the same time that our kids attend the school and we do all the activities from the home, which is a single point of failure network. Typically, the fiber to the home fiber is not protected network. And you, at least I don't remember, I don't re echo any case of a network collapse in any part of the world. So this is a very important point that we as an industry, I think that we have to use this time to put us in value. Because we still are not, in my modest view, at the level of the relevance that our technology, our investment, our teams are making for the entire society. It's incredibly the value that we have, and hopefully this gives us a little bit more of relevance. Okay? Regarding the technology, just to answer the second part very, very briefly, the technology trend that will generate, I would say is the network technology. So the network is as strong, it's a chain, it's as strong as the weakest of the segment. There is no way to have a super access network without a super aggregation, without a super core, without a super cloud. And definitely, the cloud is part of the network. The network is part of the cloud. The cloud is very heavy. <laughs> the cloud is not done in the sky. In the sky. It's plenty of iron, of germanium, of silicon as well, of course. But the cloud is everywhere. And we have to connect that one. And that is really, really heavy. And that is the network value. The network doesn't end in the home connection, continue inside the home, and doesn't finish in the central switch, if you allow me the traditional model goes to the cloud, goes to the data center, which are distributed around the globe, okay? End-to-end -end value. Okay. Thank you. Sam, please. Yeah, I, um, I think uh, you covered the, the answering the question from the different aspects, whether in the, on the application side, whether on the network side, but we as a PCCW, let me explain a little bit from a global operator point of view. So, of course, pandemic uh, changed our life, um, changed the operator life, end user's life and everything. And um, using the application became a mandatory and it's not a luxury like it used to be, which led us, and this is what we have witnessed during, during 2020, is the huge demand on capacity, whether it's an IP transit, whether it's subsea capacity, whether it's tracer capacity. So in order for all those type of applications 
to be used more by the end user. It needs more pipe, it needs more capacity. And um, with the AI coming, uh, which is part of the digital, uh, digital revolution, and also the uh, augmented reality, virtual reality, which all of this require more demand and more bandwidth. And I, I believe that whatever we have right now is not enough just to accommodate that much of, uh, of required bandwidth. Thank you. Thank you. Afternoon, everyone. I was discussing with my lunch crew uh, the invaluable task of talking to an audience right after lunch. We are all feeling nice and comfortable here in this warm room. Maybe it's just the lights overhead. So we said how we can keep it interesting. Maybe we could do it in, as an interpretive dance instead of talking to you. But I wasn't able to get my panel members to agree, so instead you just have to listen to it. I talk. didn't buy the idea, by the way. <laughs> huh? You suggested. <laughs> so I think uh, we, we are, I think it's, you know, it goes without saying, but I'll say it anyway. <laughs> uh, that the, the pandemic did in, indeed increase the demand. Uh, estimates as, as conservative as 50% on the already year-on-year -year increase in, in, in demand. Some tapering off, and by the way, I question whether we are post-COVID. Uh, everyone's getting a test right when you come into the airport, uh, you know, so on and so forth. Sure. But at any rate, uh, it's, it's, maybe we're in the long tail. Yeah. At any rate, I think we do see that there is uh, this increased demand for, for bandwidth, and it's going to continue as it always is. But this is what we're used to, right? And we typically have innovated ourselves out of that problem, right? So if you look at Release 16 uh, for 3GP or, or Doxus 3.1 uh, or even uh, Pawn networks these days, we continually innovate our way out of that bandwidth demand problem. But I think we're reaching a point, not that I'm going to be a doomsayer, but when you look at the disaggregation of the network, when you look at the increased complexity of the network, when you look at the customer demand and what their expectations are uh, to the question earlier in the audience about uh, how do we basically be everything to everyone and our customers, I think it behooves us to do more than just innovate our way out of the bandwidth issue itself and start looking at a couple of key things in how we operate those networks underneath. So these are things like uh, moving, this is an older statement, but it still hasn't been done in telco. We start to look at our service from a customer perspective. What you were talking about earlier in terms of my end-to-end uh, connectivity is my customer experience, not just one part of the network, right? It works end to end. So that, that's one part of it. We have to be proactive versus reactive in our networks. And we have to inject automation by design into everything we do, because at this scale of complexity, we simply can't achieve those customer goals, this growth, this scale, without doing these things. Uh, and these are key. So I I'll be relatively brief. At least I think I'm being relatively brief. Uh, I'll say one thing perhaps we haven't discussed that COVID really did bring to the equation that I don't think we've mentioned so far. It's a heightened attention to the edge. So I don't know, I'd ask you all to raise your hands. Uh, who, uh, I'm gonna ask you all, I want, to, I want an interactive audience. Who all has actually been at home on a conference call and had it start having an issue with connectivity, you can't hear the person on the other end? Raise your hands and show me. Everyone in the audience should say they've had a bad, so no. even no, we. we are in the UE, we don't have Oh, of course you don't. <laughs> Here you have the best bandwidth in the world. So uh, I think most of the rest of the world, however, has experienced this, this point so there's a heightened uh, focus on the edge in a way there really wasn't before, when even we who work in this industry and are technologists, most of us, have problems and can't fix our own problems. So I'm talking about things like fixed wireless access, uh, CPE placement in homes, Wi-Fi. Some of those elements of network, we used to say, oh, no, that's, that's CPE past. That's not us. Well, it is us. To the point earlier, our connectivity is Indian. So I'll leave off on there. Thank you, Ricky. Hasn't um, I, you know, at the risk of repeating some of what yeah. was said, I'll, I'll try to take another angle. Um, first of all, I mean, evidence is those countries and cities that have invested in their connectivity infrastructure have fared much better to de in dealing with COVID. Whether it was, you know, contact tracing, being online for um, online learning, uh, telemedicine, all of that. So there is evidence that these investments that were made up front in the network and in the connectivity infrastructure have definitely paid off. Now, what's changing, and I work a lot with national governments and mayors, basically, that look at smart city programs and all of that, is in a post-COVID world, the sc scrutiny and the focus on connectivity is going to be higher. It is no longer going to be a nice to have, it is going to be critical infrastructure. And that would require different models of business. No longer 
would basically the model of building the capacity as demand increases will be the norm because cities will have to be able to flex between almost a pure digital mode, a hybrid mode, and a kind of like a business as usual mode. And having the resilience to be able to flex very quickly between these modes as we have been with all the lockdowns and all of that is going to require a different way of thinking by the regulators, by the national sort of like uh, smart city programs and so forth to ensure that they're working very closely with the operators and the entire industry to make sure that we're able to build in that extra capacity in advance, right? And, and there might be, in my view, new regulatory models, new business models in terms of how you would even approach some of these network deployments. No longer would all the capex costs have to be borne by the operators. I think there's a very strong argument now that if you want to have the proper level of connectivity, there might be some future incentives in terms of helping with license costs or even like co-sharing with some of those industries like healthcare or education to contribute to the buildup of that infrastructure. So I would leave it here, but I think we're gonna see a very different way from what we have seen traditionally of how the, the regulators have been approaching connectivity and the buildup of the networks because it is critical infrastructure that is required for city resilience and nation resilience. Sure, thank you. Dr. Cindy? Yes. From your point of view? Um, I guess I'm here to present a different view as opposed to your typical operators. Operators have always been crying, give us margin, let us invest in network, we want higher margin, uh, we would like to, to go and, and continue the network build up. But the game has changed now. There are things called, there are nasty animals around you know, the perimeters called OTTs, the hyperscalers. Our model is, let's embrace these guys. Let's have a new entity in the market. Those big um, wholesalers, unify them. Build critical infrastructure, but build it once. Don't replicate it. Build huge fiber across cities, huge fiber within the city, and also data centers, international gateway, invest super heavily in these, but invest once. Once you do this, open them on an equal basis to the operators. Decouple the investment in the network. Completely decouple it. Let the operator do the stuff with the diaper stink, you know, <laughs> or the, uh, uh, the IT, or, or the other creative stuff. Let them do that and democratize that. Bring the new innovations. But the heavy hitting, the, um, the utility type, whereby you would like to have you know, 100,000 kilometers of fiber, let that be done by a different type of utility, like the electricity or, or others. The story in Italy, for example, is just is a story on the ground that tells all of us what's going on. Look at the ascending of the value of open fiber. Look at different destruction of value for Telecom Italia. That, that, that tells you a different story, which means that if the critical infrastructure continue to A, build up the fiber, B, the ch national champions in building up a uh, huge, uh, data centers and international gateways and let the operator compete. Let them take really the lowest possible cost because those critical infrastructures, they can live on um, a 10%, 12% um, EBITDA. None of the operators can eat. If, if you take them this path, you know, we're, we're talking, you know, private equity, here we come. Okay? So, with that possible transformation, I think the industry can go somewhere. The, the COVID ha has told us something. You have reached a plateau that you cannot come back, especially with um, 
governments that had foresight and, and they were creative enough and, and they were agile enough, like the government of Saudi Arabia, heavily transformed the whole educational system to be completely online. And that was amazing. Uh, there are other governments like UAE and others have, have, have done similar, uh, uh, have taken similar steps and, and others, but when you do such transformation, you can never go back to the status quo. Once you do, you do so, who gets attention? It's the Googles of the world. It's the Amazons of the world. It's the Microsoft. It's, it's all of these guys. And then all of a sudden, they're interested in your region. And then you have a dilemma. Either you bring these guys in, because they, they come with sub substantial value. Let's, let's not kid ourselves. You know, at the end of the day, everyone, customers, why do they have the, the, the connectivity? Because they want to see YouTube, and they want to see this, so and they want to Google themselves. And network optimization, mutualization. Exactly, but, but either you embrace it or you fight it. I'm proposing let's embrace it. Let's bring in these values. Let's bring in these, these big systems that will help democratize the application generation and the contribution of the young ones that can do the marsoul, uh, 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 or that can do the food deliver, or that can do, and empower them. And all of a sudden, the whole economy goes into a complete different cycle of value generation. This is my two cents worth. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cindy. Hamid, anything to add from your side? Yeah, thanks. Uh, am I audible? Yeah, great. So see, uh, I have an inherent advantage uh, amongst all of our colleagues because I come from the satellite world. So see, uh, satellite is already, was already actually going through, uh, you have kept this, uh, Evolution of network infrastructure, I would say revolution of network infrastructure. Revolution. Yeah, because satellite is actually going through a revolutionary time at the moment. Uh, for the last many decades, it has been uh, telecom operators trying to learn the satellite language in order to adopt or adapt to, to the satellite way of doing things for those sites which are mostly remote. Now, with this pandemic, I would say uh, uh, one of my friends uh, referred to as edge. You know, so, so I mean, with, with this uh, pandemic, every site is a remote site. So this is, this is interesting. But of course, the pressure on the satellites has always been on two aspects. The throughput, because it comes with huge costs. It's good that b uh, prior to our uh, panel discussion, there, Sam Samir uh, Halawi uh, touched on the satellite networks and the evolution it's going through. Uh, then the second is the latency. The, the applications now requires uh, much less latency than the traditional satellites which are 36,000 kilometers away from Earth's surface. So, so all of this, I would say, and just to keep it very brief to the point on the, on the pandemic or post-COVID, whatever you call it, uh, I would say the speed of revolution has been enhanced by this COVID. Thank and, you. And, and I would agree with, with my friends, uh, there is no going back. Thank you, Hamid. Thanks. Thank you for your insights, gents. So with this first question, we have already consumed half of our allocated timing, so <laughs> we have to be more focused now. So I will not hand over to uh, every one of you for the uh, following five questions. We still have five questions to, uh, to go. The uh, next question is about AI. And uh, we, we talk about, uh, a lot about AI, which is uh, really um, the, the trend today. Uh, so what is today uh, the contribution of uh, AI to improve uh, the uh, telecom infrastructure, the network infrastructure. So uh, maybe I'll start with you, Ricky, about that, uh, that topic. Absolutely. So I think um, AI clearly has a part in every part of network operations. The question starts with where in the network, and I think every part of network operations from application performance, for that matter, it even has you know, huge implications on, on customer interaction. Right? Uh, it's not a panacea. There's no magic, as in most 
uh, kind of technology adoption curves, you have this belief that you're going to press a button labeled AI and all your problems will be magically solved, and, and it doesn't quite work that way. But it does have applications throughout the, the network the operations part. Um, uh, we at Beyond are really focused on perhaps what is not seen today as the most sexy part, but still a most critical part, which is down in the, in the bits and bolts of the network. And so what we're seeing, I think uh, it's generally attributed to uh, Benjamin Franklin, the only thing that's certain in life is death and taxes. Well, I'd add that death, taxes, and more change in the telecom industry is going to come up. More technologies are going to come along. So we're seeing some general trends of disaggregation, software-defined networking, all of these things, which means more capability, more flexibility, but also more complexity. Hmm. And with more complexity, if we don't, if in simplest terms, do something different, we're going to just linearly increase the, the amount of people, highly skilled engineers that we need to run and operate our networks. And so what our part of the AI ML is focused on is really, and it's a bit broader than that, we call it automation intelligence versus just AI. It's about looking at the network itself and understanding, continuously monitoring it, understanding when and where there may be a potential problem. So back to my proactive comments earlier, finding out what the root of that problem is, both at an individual element, but also into end services. And that same kind of monitoring and fixing, if I use very simple terms, kind of infrastructure also applies to reducing time to market by having a better, so we're moving toward a, more of a net DevOps kind of approach where we inject all changes to the network through a CICD, CT, continuous testing, and CV, continuous validation uh, pipeline, so we can onboard those uh, network functions into the network much faster, but at much higher uh, quality because we're continuously testing them and validating them before they go into production. So it's that complete life cycle there is really where I think there are some major benefits still to be gained in terms of bringing us closer to the zero touch, reducing the amount of, of effort it takes to manage that network, and finally, uh, increasing the quality, which in turn gives uh, people like my friends over here at PCCW a better application experience for their mm -hmm. customer in the end. Thank you, Ricky. Uh, Roque, from a uh, vendor point, uh, point of view, uh, what do you think about, uh, about AI and the improvement of, of the network? Okay. So I think that the, the point was very well covered on the user part, on the application part. I think that the, uh, the artificial intelligence is part of the network itself as well. So how the network can learn, can, how the network can proactively prevent a scenario of major risks versus the pattern which is planned. Because another lesson of the COVID is that you have to be ready for the unforecastable situation, unpredictable, right? And this is part of what the network can give signals because they know in real time what is happening, how this is the profile. They can compare the scenario of the connectivity in a particular time of the day, in a day of the week, and compare with the previous one. There is many, many patterns in which the artificial intelligence can help to make the network more resilient and more efficient. Because again, this is like the trunk in the car. You can buy a bigger car, okay? but you will feel back again the trunk. Right? Sure. So you have to be more efficient, and being efficient means being intelligent, knowing what is going to happen, predict and prepare for it. Sure. Nothing, nothing is going to do it perfectly, but it's the best way to mitigate the unpredictable impact as we have seen during the, during the COVID. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. If I may add something about AI, um, I believe AI, we, we can look at AI from different perspective and different layers and different domains of the network in general. And in every domain, there is a different driver that needs AI and different value that AI can bring. I went beyond the application layer that, that we talked about, and you talked about the aggregation also uh, from operationally, from operational excellence and ADN. I still wanted to bring the benefits of AI for network sustainability. <laughs> I don't know how much I'm going to cry about that, but, uh, but really... We'll be repeating it. Yeah, no, but the thing is, the thing is, I mean, this is not just a commercial issue. No, of course. But a great part of it is commercial issue, because if you ask our operators' friends here, I mean, the most cost for the operating a network is just the electricity bill that they pay every month. I mean, some of our customers, they are scared to deploy 5G because they are afraid of energy consumption. So, so there is a commercial issue, and there is also a, a social issue about that. So anyhow, so if you look at AI from the equipment level, at least from Huawei perspective, uh, we, we, when we deploy AI in certain equipment, it cuts actually power consumption. Uh, from a box level, 
And let's say, for example, from site level, if, the, if we want to talk about mobile communication, how we can compress and integrate different bandwidth together, and then when we do massive MIMO, we use AI to predict the scenario before it happens. So different things. And also, overall network, when we do, when we predict the scenario for uh, uh, the, the site is used or not, and then we can shut down resources. Right, so these are all advantage of AI, even if we talk about data centers, uh, so forth, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, so so uh, that's important uh, from that regard, beside the need for AI in B2B applications, for example, smart factories and all things like that, quality inspection and operational excellency and ultra automation. I of just course. wanted to move on. Thank you. And please, Mohammed, from a, an operator point of view, specifically a CTIO. Kind of, I disagree with uh, my colleagues. Uh, we need to be very careful when we're talking about AI. Mm. In 1996 or 1998, I don't remember the dates, uh, uh, a Deep Blue machine was developed by IBM, uh, won a game against Gary Kasparov, the world champion in chess. Next day in the newspaper, big headlines, we lost in the front of AI. Now we know that that wasn't AI, that was only a power of processing. Mm -hmm. That's what, what we lost in the front of now. Today, I think uh, we are sure 100% that nobody can com uh, compete against a computer in a chess game. We will lose because of the processing power in that machine. Uh, moving forward, uh, what we are trying now to implement in the, about the infrastructure, we are talking about the infrastructure, there are three different types of infrastructure. One is the passive network, uh, which there is no much intelligence in it, so we cannot support it much. In terms of maximum, we can shut down on or off, that's it. Mm -hmm. But the active parts is very important, where most of the automation, the processing power, and AI later on will come up, and this is depend we are depending on our colleagues in the telecom provider to support us. However, we as a telecom operator, we start implementing our own uh, methods and algorithm to facilitate things. So by within two years, we are planning to have a network self-operation, regardless of the roadmap from the telecom vendors. We are planning to do it ourselves. And by doing that, we are not using AI till now. We are using only kind of automation. A trends, and then we know what to do based on that trends, and react based on that. So this is, there is no, no, AI, no AI coming. Uh, the third point, which we might start using AI is the people, which is part of our infrastructure as well. We consider them as part of our infrastructure. Now, a human being against a machine, definitely in this game, the human being will lose always. Of course. Bef uh, last week, or this week, Elon Musk launched officially his uh, project to implant a chipset in the human being brain. So for the first time, now we as a human, we have the ability and the power to fight against the machines. Are we creating kind of superhero? Kind of. Will they be, be able to be uh, more super? No, the, but I will have more processing power. I will be able to remember everything. I'll be able to be connected to the internet. So I'll be able at the end to uh, maintain my job, do it in a better way, enhance my outcome, and be able to compete my job in front of the, the machines. Later on, I believe that AI will come after five or six years from not now. We're talking about now machines that keep teaching it by itself. The moment we are there, and the moment we embed those machines or chipsets in our brains, then we can start talking about the real AI. Okay, you've got a point. Uh, Dr. Cindy, you want to comment on, uh, on AI? We look at AI in a, a little bit more mundane uh, way. Uh, however, with, with profound effect. So for example, we're experimenting right now uh, with taking the network much closer to the uh, consumer. So we're experimenting with in, in those power stations where we're putting edge computing and edge storage. And on top of that, you have a content uh, distribution network. Once you have that, you need AI to store a lot of the parameters that uh, how data is consumed, what the consumer in that very specific neighborhood, you know, be it Al Maadi or be it Al Alaya, very specific interest. So then you completely take up the uh, customer experience to a completely different level. You know, 
um, whereby you, you, you are so much more interested in, in your neighborhood and what's going on rather than with what's going on in Texas. Okay, if you want, if you want to get connected with what's going on in Texas, we'll do that to, uh, for you. But it's a, it's a different experience. And imagine if, if you take the network and if you take the customer experience to such an amazing level, and then all of a sudden, you start creating different value. You start creating new businesses. You start finding these young men and women who all of a sudden come up with a, an ice cream distribution thing, you know, only in his neighborhood or in her neighborhood, and, and then start making money. Or you, you somehow... Um, go to these uh, fashionistas or whatever that can create fashion value that is fairly very very specific. So AI can can play a whole lot of uh, um, uh, uh, deliver a whole lot of value in either predicting or aggregating, or that aggregation can can be sold to people that can make use of that. Um, the Samsung uh, TV or um, the heater or whatever um, uh, appliances or other services or the, even the cat groomer or, you know, you can, you can just take it to the nth degree. So even with little applications like this, the impact on daily life is, is so fundamental. And then as a, as a wholesaler, if you can do a little bit with that, you know, a little bit to, to facilitate that, I think that would be wonderful. Thank you so much. Since AI is a very hot topic, so I suggest we'll take a question from the, the audience and to be sure that everyone is still following. So uh, do we have any questions on that specific topic from the audience? No? Seems not. So we'll move to the uh, following questions, unless someone from the panel would like to add a comment about AI. No. We were so eloquent, they had yeah. no questions. Yeah. Great. <laughs> it means that they were following and every, everything Absolutely. was so clear. That's very good. Exactly. That's, what, that's what's going on in my head anyway. Okay, so great. Let's move to the uh, next question. So, can you explain how it is likely to gain more bandwidth out of existing networks? How would a higher bandwidth translate to better service and experience? So, maybe I will start with you, uh, Sameh, about it. Yeah, sure. Um, the development of technology, mainly in DWDM, made a huge difference uh, and helped monetizing the existing network. Uh, we have witnessed similar few years back when the first 400G were introduced into the market, and now with the 800G that is coming, which one of the main feature is um, the ability to increase the capacity per fiber, as well as um, extend the wavelengths across any path through adjustable, remote adjustable, uh, and um, in, in li line rates. So with, with, with the huge demand, we need to embrace that su such technology in, uh, in order to accommodate the market needs. Uh, one of the other examples is the smart um, uh, capacity allocation based on usage base as well. Uh, smart cable routing planning, uh, where uh, where we have to plan ahead, seek uh, uh, the balance between shorter routes and uh, to avoid external factors such as geopolitics, uh, fishing zones, uh, earthquake zones, and so on and so forth. So um, uh, this will allow us and uh, uh, actually allow the industry to extract more capacity and more bandwidth from the new submarine cable level. Thank you, Sam. Please, okay. Mohammed. I mean, j just to add uh, on that as well, um, I mean, we, we just have to leverage on technology. There's nothing else we, we, we can do if we want to optimize it with the growth of traffic that we've seen. I mean, I, I recall in the early 90s when some of the cables started coming around Africa, um, the whole design capacity of that cable was about 120 gigs. Today we're talking about cables that are coming where everybody is going to have his own pair, and there are going to be 12 pair cables on it and each of them is going to have like 10 terabytes. And we're still panicking to say, look, based on all the things we've been discussing today, these capacities might still be, be, be outrun because we're seeing people living, working, and playing on the, on the, on the net now because that's where everybody lives, um, basically. So whether we like it or not, we need to invest in that technology. We need to also uh, adopt the sharing of, 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 of infrastructure. I mean, I was listening to Doctor 
and I was wondering if he was, um, he was privy to some of my strategy because what we've done is that we've got about 85,000 proprietary fiber on the continent of Africa, which I believe is the most extensive and it was built and used only for, for running about over 280 million subscribers. What we've done in the last three and a half years, like Fred was talking about earlier on, is to open that network for everybody to use. And in opening that network, we're adopting new technologies that scale up the, 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 the bandwidth and the requirement of the capacity to be able to meet not just our own use, but also other MNOs and other network operators like us, and even the hyperscalers that we've seen coming in. So we're looking at it end to end. The subsea coming into the CLSs, the data centers, down into the metros and into the NLDs and make sure that we optimize um, um, I mean, the use of technology to grow up the bandwidth and open it up for everybody's use. Thank you. Muhammad, your opinion? Uh, very tough question because we are engaged now uh, on the, how the future will look like. And uh, today, if we are talking about, if the telecom operators are talking about providing a decent quality of service using 5G, the demand is a minimum of 100 megahertz. If we are talking about 6G, they are talking about, we are talking of telecom service provider, talking about 3,000 megahertz. I don't think that any telecom authority will be able to release such amount mm -hmm. of spectrum now. And I, think, I don't think any telecom operator will be able even to acquire and pay for this amount of, of, of a spectrum that will be needed. So what options do we have? Uh, one of the options uh, that we have is the private networks, small private networks. People are talking to fiber to the home, uh, fiber to the corner. Now we are talking about fiber to the room. So you will have your own fiber in your room and your own private network in your room that's serving only you. So without any other external interference, without all this needed uh, spectrum, you'll be able to achieve better quality of service than now. Uh, second thing, we were talking about the digital gap in, in, in Africa, for example, compared to the rest of the world. We have decided to, as we operate also in Africa and in Asia, where the digital gap is really big between the, the, those countries and the remaining countries, we have decided to start implementing 5Gs in some of the most dangerous and remote areas like Afghanistan, it's a war zone. Can we implement 5G? Yes. Can we implement 5Gs the same way we implemented and the same course implemented in UE? No, because I don't think we don't need it. However, we managed to implement a solution today in Afghanistan using an open run technology, for example, that is ready immediately to be evolved to 5G with minimum amount of cost comparing to the classical solution. So there are solutions. There is a different way of, of techniques that each operator needs to implement, taking into account which quality of service your customer is looking and how much money you are, you are ready to pay. Back to Dr. Ahmed's point as well, I think their fight between the OTT and the operators has to stop. Yeah. What happened in India with Geo is a great story that we need to learn, and each of us, we need to learn about it, where Geo, an operator that operates in India with an ARBO less than $1 a month, managed to sell stocks that worth more than $20 billion to giants in the OTT to enhance the network quality of service and the competition. And now Geo is talking about acquiring a BT in UK with all this amount of money they got from those OTTs. So it's a collaboration rather than a fight that we think that for years and decades that we need to fight the OTT. I think we need to collaborate to enhance the quality of service and the, to reduce the digital gap today we are facing. Okay, thank you yeah. so much. If, if please, I may add please, to uh, more examples, actually I agree 100%, it's a good example uh, about fiber to the room, you know, beyond just the fiber to the, to the home. Uh, also, another uh, example uh, from wireless communication, of course, we all know even if we have limited bandwidth, you can use MIMO, massive MIMO. That would also give you uh, more data speed out of your uh, limited bandwidth. Uh, it, uh, as a matter of fact, in, in, in Jafza here in, uh, in Dubai, when we had our uh, MBB forum, we actually achieved the higher data rate indoor by having distributed MIMO for multiple uh, Pico radio units. So these are two examples. A third example from uh, IP, from routers. 
Uh, if you can control the, uh, the, uh, the power consumption on the BCP board, you can actually get that board to consume like, uh, or to pass higher speed, like instead of 400G, maybe 800G. If you can do intelligent or natural cooling for your data center, you can even serve uh, more capacity in terms of uh, megawatt of, uh, of capacity. So I think it's different perspective. Innovation, what can bring a capacity more than or out of what your assets is the innovation in every single piece, even component level, box level, network level about the synergy. If you synergize, cancel the interference, you can get more also. Of course, thank you. Uh, Dr. Cindy, would you like to comment about, uh, about this topic? Better experience with the bigger bandwidth? I think our friends in uh, both in, in, in Nokia, uh, Huawei, and uh, CNN, and, 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 and uh, these guys are doing wonders especially in, in slicing up fibers and doing um, new technologies where on, on, on packets whereby um, this fiber to home business, the fiber to the room business can, can actually deliver real value to, to the consumer. Um, uh, we really count on them and we look at uh, the, uh, what they can deliver because it is this type of experience that will, will support 6G. Because, because today, we talk about 5G and, 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 and so on and so forth, but as a, as a, a friend of mine who, who is uh, very well versed in the consulting business says, if you wear um, a marathon jacket, it doesn't say that you're actually capable of running the marathon. So, okay, fine, we have 5G network. But unless the core of the 5G network follows the 5G, you have really nothing. You have 4G, but, but it, that looks pretty. But it ain't 5G. You know, it looks like it's 5G, but it isn't. So again, it is that work done by those guys, those wonderful guys that are giving us the 800 gig and beyond. This is the technology that we want to watch and make sure, not only watch, but make sure that it finds its way into deployment as soon as possible, because that's the real enablement of, of 5G and possibly 6G. And the investment in that particular bit of the network, this is the kind of investment that will deliver the real bang for the buck and will enable all these beautiful things that, that, that my uh, uh, colleague in Itzala talked about and my other colleagues talked about because this is your, literally this is your fundamental backbone. Without this, you know, everything else is academic. True. Hazem, please. Um, just, it's, it's all about doing more with less. And in many ways, again, talking to CTOs from cities like Amsterdam, Helsinki, they're not going to be allowing, you know, 5G operators or 6G later on for each one of them to come in and have their own cell sites. It's just not gonna be doable the way that maybe we had some you know, optional tower sharing and all of that with 4G. So it's very important you know, when we're thinking about all of these synergies, these common uh, infrastructure sort of like synergies that the multiple operators can get from each other, it's gonna be very important to take that in mind. In addition to all the improvements you know, that we're thinking about how to use spectrum more efficiently and all of that, it is also about how we go about the deployment. A city wants to have one smart pole, right? With everything on it, you know, the sensors, the, the 5G, and they're not gonna allow this for multiple operator. It, it looks ugly, it's going to, you know, be costly. Be, you know, yes, it's a revenue stream for the city, but a lot of city councils won't allow that. Can, can I just, just a quick comment on, on, on off the cuff, if you one. will? La, la, very quick. If you want a cheating way to look at the future, just follow the money trail. Look at those private equity and the market is paying which multiples for what companies. That tells you the whole story. It just follow the money. Please, Rocky. I listen more with less. I mean, we have been doing this for years. Our fiber capacity has been increased by one million times. 
I'm not exaggerating, one million times capacity. Our access car was few kilobits when we were a little bit younger, not that much, but okay, a little bit younger. And now we are talking at several gigas, hundreds of gigas, even one terabit interfaces, right? So doing more with less for sure is part of our engineering job, okay? And when you face the purchasing department, you learn that lesson very much, right? But the very point is doing differently here, okay? And I'm back to the point of Dr. Amel. The business model is failing. Engineers, I believe, are doing their job. The technology are really enabled a scenario that were a dream a few years ago. Okay? Fibers, you mentioned 12 fibers. We see 12, even 14, even 24 cores in very soon in the, in the cable. We were doing few 10 gigabits, few tens of gigabits. Now we are doing 200, 300, even 400 in the size. The coordination between the IP layer and the optical layer, the dry and the web plants are going to be fundamental. The capacity is not going to be a problem. The problem is how we make money from it. Okay? And I want just to make a sample as Dr. Ramon mentioned. The new games, the new players, okay? the web scalers. You go to the submarine network, for example. Traditionally, what is the cycle of an opportunity in submarine network? It's years until you take a decision. And then you have the deployment time. Okay? Today, a single decision maker is getting more cables than anyone else before. Okay? So this is a very important thing. I believe that the industry has to react. The time to market, the, go, the model of the business for operators and for everyone in this industry has to change dramatically. Network infrastructure, network uh, transformation is a fundamental piece of that. But that will not be only. That will be only the muscle, not the brain. We need both. I've, I've heard two very important words, sustainability and cooperation. Cooperation between operators and between operators and OTT players. And actually, we can see, like, for instance, Facebook in Africa is working a lot with some operators to deploy fiber for uh, rural connectivity, etc. And, and I'm sure this will be booming afterwards. Thank you, Jens. Yeah, but Let I like what he mentioned about the dollar per unit bandwidth. That's a very yes. good one. <laughs> yeah. So we have carbon so per bit, the money. carbon <laughs> emission per <laughs> bit, and we have dollar per, so you know, per unit bandwidth, yes. Thank you, Jens. Mm. So moving to the uh, next question, mm. another source of uh, re reliable source of connectivity is submarine cables. Uh, will submarine cables be able to sustain the current demand for network capacity and coverage worldwide, and how? So, please, if we can uh, start with you, Samer. Yeah, sure. Actually, I disagree with you. Mm -hmm. You disagree? There is, there is a shortage worldwide. Mike, please. Yeah. <laughs> or Samer. Yeah, I think it's working. Yeah, there is, there is a huge shortage in capacity worldwide nowadays because. The, the not because of technology. Not because of technology. I said not because of technology. No, because um, usually it takes one to three years to plan for any new subsea systems. And then you need an additional three years for implementation. This gap actually put all of us in a shortage of capacity. Um, therefore, we need to be ahead of the game. We need to plan ahead of anything. Um, but as you said, with the existing of or the future of the technology, as we mentioned about 400 gig and 800 gig, now it allow us to e expand the bandwidth per fiber and also the multiple of fiber uh, uh, in each system. So uh, uh, it's, it's yes and no, if, if you know what I mean. Technology is helping, but we are running against time, unfortunately. No, I, I, my, my point was regarding the technology capability. Yeah. So the capability of growing the capacity of this tall plant. Absolutely. The new ones coming with larger capacity, but larger when is the of next fiber. one? We are talking about three, three, yes. three to four years. So from you now. take two years to take a decision, Absolutely. you cannot expect the network deploy shorter. Right? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, please. I mean, you, you met mentioned of um, one of the hyperscalers I think working in Africa to, to, to bring in, um, to do metro and, and terrestrial coverages. We've partnered with one of them to bring one of the cables coming into Africa, and I think it's the longest cable that is going to go around Africa. And we've also partnered with them. I mean, like Mohammed was saying earlier on, you don't fight them, but you partner with them. So we've partnered with them, and uh, we're bringing this scale in. Does the capacity we have today enough to, to sustain our demand into the future? I think no and yes. No in the sense that we're all panicking so more or less in the industry because we can see that capacities are going out all over the world. However, I think we can optimize some of the traffic that we pass out by localizing traffic, especially in the continent where I come from, where we operate. We've seen that most of our traffic is going back to Asia, to Europe, to the Americas. But you could see that there's a deliberate work now going on to localize this traffic by getting more hyperscaler data centers to localize this traffic. And I think that might give us just a, a small window 
before the new cables come in. But I mean, the cable deployments are also very fast now because the decisions are quicker than they used to be before. I mean, from being PTNs owning cables, it became consortium people, I mean, partners, it became investors trying to invest. Now you can see that the hyperscalers with all the big box are coming in and we're all partnering with them to see that cables come in. So I, I see a lot of more cables coming in and a lot of more localization of, of traffic in, in, in geographical areas to at least ease the, the, the huge demands. Yeah, Frederick talked this morning about uh, 150,000 kilometers that you are deploying within uh, MTN, right? Yes. Um, so we, 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 I mean, we've got about eight, uh, 100, we've got about uh, 85, but we're now deploying additional 35 in the next three years to make sure that we cover the continent. So uh, for us, apart from just the subsea, we also believe that if we're able to do terrestrial coverages across the continent, mm -hmm. we can also reduce latency and also bring about scale and create the required resilience that is required, uh, yes, on the subsea cable. Within, 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 yes, within the regions as well. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Dr. Cindy, you, want, you wanted to talk about the sub submarine cables and the capacity that could, they could bring. We to see more of them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys, anyone want to comment on submarine cables? No. Again, perhaps I, I just recap again, uh, you, you say a very important thing, the coordination between the wet and the dry plant. Okay? Yeah. Uh, again, what we are talking about, the cloud, the cloud is not somewhere else, it's around us. And the distribution of that, the, the capability to distribute that edge across the continent, the country, the city, mm -hmm. is going to be a fundamental thing. Yeah. So more fiber to connect the data center, that is a fundamental one. of traffic even at the edge. This year, 2022, uh, it was uh, expected that half of the enterprise data, overall global enterprises, are going to be processed at the edge. And GSMA actually predicting in three or four years, there will be about 24 billion edge nodes globally. Actually, 20% of those is going to use 5G. So I think intelligent edge from different perspective, from uh, uh, security reasons for uh, stringent uh, requirements on services, for localization to gain more bandwidth, for different reasons to get more dollar per bandwidth. I think all of that uh, is, is going to be very important yeah. on the last level beyond the submarine. You need to slice the optical as well, not only the radio, the optical, <laughs> the slice. Okay, thank you guys. Moving to the next question. So what are the biggest effects of hyperscale networks on carrier networks? How would this impact the shift to cloud native development of telcos? Maybe I'll start with you, Rocky, again. On, on, on. Yeah. So again, is first, I think, more money at the table. More That's money. a very good news, okay. Faster and very innovative business cases. That for sure help. And whatever is fomenting the or pushing to have a, a more digitalization in the in the field is going to help us because at the end of the day the technology is not only a technical beauty context, it's the what for, not, not the how it works, right? So these guys are bringing a lot of new a lot of new uh, business streams, and as Dr. Hamad said before, and I think Etisolat is, is looking at it as well, we have to embrace them. They are part of the ecosystem as well. And as the network reach the homes or even the rooms, it reaching the cloud inside and even very much inside in deep of the data center. And all of that can be uh, the end-to-end -end ecosystem that we can facilitate for them to make the new business uh, profitable for all of us. Okay. Yeah, if I may comment on... Yeah, please. Well, I agree, you have to embrace them, but uh, you cannot just say that uh, out loud for every kind of scenario. So there are, of course, we know that uh, there are some scenarios that... Uh, of operator can collaborate with hyperscalers uh, in order to bring uh, you know, uh, cloud services to enterprises. But if, uh, if the operator have their telco edge ready and close to the enterprise, they can monetize it more. And also for different kind of services that require maybe data sovereignty or uh, requires uh, stringent service, service requirements, I think using the public cloud may not be the ultimate no, no, for sure. uh, I mean, solution. Technology solution is yeah, one yeah, thing. Yeah. Uh, Oh, but for business, yeah, but I agree. But what I mean is not, I mean, it's not going to fit all of the scenarios, but conceptually, of course. it is needed. First, everything is relative. Yes, there is yes, no yes, absolute yes. truth anywhere. Of but my, my point is that we cannot see that to as a different animal coming here. It's all part of the same ecosystem here. Okay? No, we're all for sure, business. regulation <laughs> <laughs> regulation must be, must have a talk, okay? of course. not only because of privacy, of individual, even a government, even a national security, there is a lot of things to say. Okay? Mm. But again, you cannot stop 
the innovation that these guys are coming. Mm. Okay? That is a, a, real, a real fact. Okay? And then the differentiator that an operator, just to make an example here, can do is that stability and predictability of the network that they have to secure the user experience yeah. that they are looking. That is the real value of the network and exposing that and making it real uh, visible to, to, the, yeah. to the different yeah. services. Just okay. go to the cloud. Yes, Multi-cloud service. <laughs> um, the issue of data sovereignty is, is not going to be the protector for the operators. Because even that data sovereignty, and, and I agree, a whole bunch of uh, regulators, and rightfully so, they are pushing data sovereignty um, rules, which is great. And I think it's fantastic. Why? Because for a very, very, very different reason. Because it is bringing the AWS and the Googles of the world and the Microsoft of the world to be in your data center, to use your own fiber, to use your international gateway, and then deliver their services locally. So indeed, then the data for the Data Sovereignty Act would have been fulfilled because then all of that is staying in the country. So what has happened by the Data Sovereignty Act? It brought part of the value and localized it into the, the local economy. That is important, that is fundamental. That, that's, that's something great. But we have to be careful going further steps, meaning would regulators allow um, certain bundling between connectivity and cloud so that the operator then, then really push the customer in a certain way to certain cloud versus compared to others. These are issues that need to be further looked at and further analyzed. And, and the regulator needs to really look where, where the value is, not the value today, but what is the impact on the industry. And, and, and that's a... a these are uh, 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 tough issues. These are not something that can be resolved in, in a day or two sure. because the resolution also affects the future. And, and then each regulator needs to think, you know, what is my very specific country's position? Where do, where do I want to grow? Which value segment do I want to grow? And, and, and the resolution of this question would actually be very different from one place to the other. Some places are very much concerned about growth and, and, and offering service to um, uh, the, uh, the local customer, and they would want anybody who wants to invest. That's beautiful. Do that. But another place would have a different uh, um, uh, resolution of the question because their position in the value chain is very, very different from that other place. Okay. So th there is no one solution that fits all. Okay. It depends on each, each position. Okay. Thank you. There is a Please, quote Hazen, of someone. To, to, let me give the, yes. the floor okay. to Hazan to conclude this question because really you are running out sure. of time. I, I see the organizers yeah. are. No, uh, I, I, yeah. I mean, just, <laughs> just a final comment on regulation. The gap basically has always been there between you know, the speed of innovation that we're coming up with technology and, and the regulation. And I see this gap even widening you know, and getting even more with some of the things we're seeing and some of the difficult questions about ethical AI, about privacy, how do you deal with private sector data, not to say the least, everything else we've talked about, about uh, you know, keeping control of your data within your own sovereign uh, space. And I'll stop here because I think we're yeah. already behind schedule. Hamid, sorry, we'll skip the last question about satellite, but we <laughs> talked already about the importance of satellite and the connectivity and what they will bring, yeah, right? I, uh, I believe we'll have to have a separate session for satellites. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> and, and especially with the, with the kind of revolution that we have. And what, what, with the revolution what, that you're yeah. talking about. But let's keep in mind sustainability, optimization, and money. <laughs> Thank you, gents, for your contribution and for your insights. Thank you all.